everyone. Hi, everyone. Could I have your attention, please? My name is Yu Yu, uh, environmental specialist uh, focused on biodiversity at ADB. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of ADB Environment Thematic Group to the third webinar of Green Road to Kunming Workshop Series, co-hosted by Climate Change Disaster Risk Management Thematic Group and Urban Sector Group. Well, as you may already know, this webinar series has already conducted two sessions, respectively on green transport sector and green energy sector. This workshop series aims to bring focus to the issue of infrastructure and biodiversity, showcases multiple benefits of integrating nature-based solution into infrastructure project, and also provide an opportunity for all of us to contribute to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which is to be adopted by the COP15 as a Convention of Biological Diversity. Well, having said that, before we get down to the business, I do have a piece of news to share with you all. Just uh, the day before yesterday, um, the Convention of Biological Diversity has officially decided that a part two of COP15 will be moved from Kunming to Montreal, Canada and will take place this December. So our series may do have to change a name, uh, but no matter which city we are heading to COP, we do need to head into a green future together because that's probably the only possible future for us, for all of us. Okay, so today we are looking into green coastal developments. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, welcome Ms. Noelle, Noelle O'Brien. We're extremely too happy to have you here. She is the, climate, uh, the Chief of Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Thematic Group, concurrently Director of ADB. Well, Noel, thank you very much for being with us today. Well, despite your fully booked agenda, the floor is yours, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Yu, and thank you for inviting me to be with you today for this uh, important event. So uh, as you have indicated, this is the third event. So welcome uh, to this event on the Green Road to Kunming, Montreal webinar series. Um, the goal of this series is to showcase environmentally sustainable infrastructure and the multiple benefits of integrating green measures in transport, energy, urban, and coastal development. So for today's session, it is on green coastal development. So let me say good morning to all of the participants uh, from our ADB headquarters in Manila. And I understand that we have some uh, participants from our de developing member countries. Um, so let me extend a special welcome to you for this session today. So through this series, we would like to help inform you as you prepare to attend the upcoming Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD COP, and submit your commitments to meet the post-2020 global diversity framework uh, targets. The post-2020 GDF aims to transform economic, social, and financial models in order to stabilize biodiversity loss by 2030 and to allow the recovery of natural ecosystems by 2050. Application of nature-based solutions in infrastructure development will play a critical role in meeting GBF targets. We're today with our special attention to coastal e ecosystems, we recognize that ecosystem, coastal ecosystems are degrading rapidly due to human and natural causes. It is estimated that currently only about 15% of coastal areas are still intact globally. Billions of people in Asia and the Pacific, especially the poor and vulnerable, depend on coastal and marine ecosystems for their livelihood, health, nutrition, and entertainment. In addition, 
healthy coastal ecosystems are important to help protect coastal communities against increasing, in, sorry, increasingly common and severe extreme weather events. Therefore, urgent actions need to be taken to enable green and climate resilient coastal development. Considering environmentally sustainable and green infrastructure is essential to deliver important social and economic goals while avoiding or minimizing harmful impacts on habitats and wildlife that provide us with critical coastal ecosystem services, such as flood protection, fisheries production, space for recreation, and climate mitigation and adaptation. Such infrastructure serves to support a green economy, to reduce costs, to create job opportunities, and enhance human well-being. ADB is supporting coastal infrastructure development under the transport, urban, energy, agricultural, and natural resources sectors. In addition, ADB is currently implementing a, a major initiative called the Action Plan for Healthy Oceans and Sustainable Blue Economies. Under this action plan, ADB has committed to invest $5 billion between 2019 and 2024 to support DMCs to protect and restore marine ecosystems and promote inclusive livelihood opportunities. Coastal development should be equitable, fair, and take into account environmental and social considerations. As mandated by ADB's safeguard policy, for all ADB financed and administered investment projects, Proper upstream planning for development and improved design and siting can avoid or minimize negative social and environmental impacts, as well as reduce project costs and delay. Strategic thinking is needed at landscape level to improve coastal development through integrated coastal zone management including addressing the links between land-based and ocean-based livelihoods. These need to be done in a manner that promotes resilient human environment systems and strong blue economies. So today you're gonna to hear about approaches for more resilient coastal development, insurance tools to minimize risk and liability, ways to protect wildlife by preventing illegal transport in our seaports and airports, and how we can design and develop green, sorry, how we can design and develop greener ports. Multiple benefits of upstream planning and adoption of nature-based measures and biodiversity-friendly coastal development projects will help achieve the proposed 2020 GBF targets of having 30% of all land and sea under area protection by 2030. So I encourage you all to listen to the presentations today and to engage your, with your speakers on how to integrate nature-based and environmentally friendly approaches into your upcoming or ongoing projects. So thank you very much and wishing you well for the rest of today's event. Thank you, Noel, for this great introduction. Thank you. Indeed, as you mentioned, a green coastal development is particularly relevant in the Asia Pacific region with its varying, varying environment, geographic, and social economic features. So, it is with this consideration in mind, we have invited four uh, experts working on different fronts in this area to share their stories today. Before we start, Allow me to take one minute to introduce some house rules. For our speakers, please uh, keep to the allotted time, which is 20 minutes, and try to speak slowly and enunciate. We are providing Russian and Chinese interpreters interpretation today. That will be a huge help for our now speaker audience. 
uh, including myself. Okay, and then for our audience, uh, dear guests, we're be Q and A after the second presentation, and also at the end, you may put your question in the Q and A box or raise your hand during the open discussion. And the speakers may have a minute. Please check the Q and A box and answer some questions when you can. Okay, then our first presentation will be given by Matt Vanderklift. Matt is director of IORA Indian Ocean Blue Carbon Hub and principal research scientist of CSIRO. He has over 25 years of experience studying coast vegetated ecosystem and has worked in seagrass and other ecosystem in, in the Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean seas. His recent work has also put a lot of focus on blue carbon as well. He will share his insights today into the resilience, restoration and regeneration of coastal development. Let me hand over to Matt. Thank you, UAU, and uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure for me to be here today. Let me just get my slides organized. I hope you can see that. Someone will tell me if you can't, I'm sure. So the green road to Kunming now, perhaps the green road to, to Montreal, I would like to take a, a little detour up the green road and take you on the blue road for, for just a few minutes where I can talk about what's happening on, on perhaps the, the ocean and coastal side of uh, the earth systems that we're talking about. And perhaps a starting point is the World Economic Forum. They met, as you might know, just a, a few weeks ago in, in Davos in, in Switzerland, part of the, the annual meeting that the World Economic Forum has. And the World Economic Forum puts together an annual report as part of, part of their activities. This is the annual report for 2022. And they list in their annual report the 10 biggest risks to the planet, the planet's economy, the planet's people. Five of the 10 biggest risks are environmental around climate and around biodiversity. And of the other risks, it's no surprise perhaps that Others are societal risks that are linked to environment, think infectious diseases and livelihood crisis. These are bigger risks, they say, than geopolitical or even financial and economic risks. So how do we get from this situation, sobering as it is, to this situation? This is the vision that we have for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, the 2020 vision of living in harmony with nature. And as part of that, we have a stop in 2030 with uh, some actions that we wanna do around ecosystems, species diversity, human needs, and, and uh, so on. There's a lot to do. So what are the tools and the solutions that we can implement to help us get there? Well, of course, we need to transform. And as Noelle was saying in her opening comments, we need to transform from an unsustainable approach to a sustainable approach. And that means transforming from an approach that's destructive and generates unproductive coastal systems to one that's sustainable, that is actually regenerative and generates productive coastal ecosystems. So how do we do that? I can stand in my office as a scientist working on these things and say it, but that's all a bit glib. So let's have a think about how we can do it. Part of what we're talking about is simply by thinking about nature a little bit differently and approaching the way we interact with nature a little bit differently. So this means that we stop thinking of nature as a resource to be used and perhaps misused, but also that we'll move away from the approach of where we, we simply think of nature as, as an asset, something to be put on our balance sheets. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those approaches. We still need to use nature as a resource, we still need to have our fisheries, for example, in the ocean. Ocean accounts are useful, but those alone 
of course, won't help us solve the problems. We have to be thinking about nature in a way that's much more integrated with the way that we act and approach just our daily activities from the way we go about uh, making a living to the way we grow our food, produce our food, transport our goods, all of these things, such that we're talking about, yes, we need to protect some areas, but we also need to restore some areas. We need to think about how we're going to use infrastructure with the ultimate goal of not only generating the biodiversity benefits, but improving human well-being. There was a report that some of us were part of, I think the link will appear in the chat, which was around coastal development and, and what we can do to build resilience and restore and regenerate. There's a lot in that report. I'm not going to talk about everything. There's not enough time. I'll just have a little few vignettes about building ecosystem resilience and about sustainable climate ready infrastructure. When we think about resilience, we can think about it in a few different ways. One of the important ways that I spend a lot of time myself thinking about is building resilience to climate, mitigating climate and adapting to climate. And the ocean and the coast can actually provide part of the solutions that we're looking for to help us with climate mitigation. In fact, if we put, this is another report from the United Nations High Level Panel, if we put together things like ocean renewable energy and transforming the transport with restoring the coast, we can get perhaps 900,000 uh, sorry, 900 million tonnes of carbon dioxide mitigation. Now, we need to get 30 gigatons, so that's 30 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide mitigated in the next 10 years in order to be on track to where we want to be. So that's, that's modest, but if we put them all together, we can get up to 12% of the climate mitigation that we need from the ocean. And just by using the coast more wisely by protecting and restoring coastal ecosystems, we can get about almost a gigaton of that. We're a long way from that, but we can do it. And if we do do it, it turns out that we start addressing some of the other problems that are proving to be intractable as well. Things like extreme events. Extreme events, as we have seen in the news um, in the subcontinent just this last week, record heat record floods. These extreme events can um, produce very profound impacts on the coast in terms of lives, livelihoods, infrastructure. But if we use the ecosystems in the way that uh, we could deploy them to actually have a role in protecting the coast, they can provide mitigation, not just of the climate, but also of floods and of waves. And it turns out that they can do it in a fairly cost-effective way. So that if we, for example, just mangroves, if we look at mangrove planting and restoration and protection programs, they can provide benefits that are up to 10 times the cost that we put into them. So these things have a lot of potential and we can do it at scale. So I'm not just talking about you know, a little patch here and a little patch there, we are actually now able in many instances to do this over hundreds and perhaps thousands of hectares. There are examples around the world now that show that this is possible. Um, I've just shown some examples of ones that I'm familiar with, our coastal plant ecosystems, things like mangroves and marshes. We do know how to regenerate at scale. We're working on the reef ecosystems, the corals, the oysters, we know that it is possible. Some technological improvements, but the scaling is happening. So there's hope, we can do this. Which brings us to coastal infrastructure, a different kind of problem. This is often in the context of urbanized coast. They're busy places, lots of activities, space is contested, lots of people, 
many things to try and account for. And there's a lot of hard structures and then there's a lot of hard infrastructures in there. Just, just think of the amount of concrete along the coastline. If you put the world's concreted coastlines end to end, they would stretch from Manila to Vietnam. So there's, there's a lot out there. So some of it, of course, we need. We do need hard armoring of shorelines to protect us from some of those extreme events. Some of it, perhaps we don't need. So there's some thinking to do around what's important, what's perhaps something that we, we can forego for other opportunities. But even when we're thinking about the infrastructure and the infrastructure that's important, we can start doing it in an integrated way that builds in some of the benefits that nature has to offer. And so thinking about coastal urban infrastructure, if we're, if we're uh, building um, integrated systems that not only cater for, for transport, but also for, for business, for accommodation, we can do it in a way that perhaps allows us to deploy mariculture. Shellfish are really good at absorbing contaminants, absorbing pollutants, but that doesn't mean, of course, that we stop, we, we stop trying to prevent those at their source, but we can deploy them in the coast to actually help us clean up the coast. Of course, we can start integrating some, some of the low carbon renewable energy options. There's a range of different options that we can use. And, and some of those are, are highlighted in a, in a report by the Blue Natural Capital Finance Facility, some colleagues over there. And I think that link will also go in the chat if it hasn't already. And we can also move beyond just the hard infrastructure. So as I mentioned, sometimes we do need cement concrete for armoring the coast, but we can do it in a different way. We can do it in a way that actually starts to create habitat and, and provide opportunities for different species to, to thrive and to grow. Some of those might be there for biodiversity purposes, as we're talking about today, but some of them might actually be there for other purposes, um, including perhaps even for, for food production, or as I've mentioned, for, for removing pollutants and contaminants. So having these hybrid seawall approaches is, is really something very promising that I would like to, to see a lot more work doing and, and could help us meet some of our goals. Now, of course, everybody has a different role and that's something that we need to acknowledge. I'm a scientist. I think about ways that we can do it, and ways that we can implement the different solutions. But we have governments and we have different communities. And then we have also the investors. And if, you know, perhaps, perhaps there's some of the investment community being a development bank event. So how do we start getting those conversations going such that the investors and the scientists and the communities and the NGOs have a conversation and start talking the same language. Because we do know what many of the solutions are. We just need to explain it to each other and understand how best to deploy them. As an example, and the investment ecosystem, if you like, has a number of options that we can deploy. And I know ADB is already deploying them in a few different instances. So we can deploy bonds, we can use trusts in different ways, um, loans and concessional loans, blended finance, these are all possible. There's a growing interest in, in using market-based um, mechanisms. So sustainable trade and payments for ecosystem services. We, we just need to have the forum to have the conversation to see which options are going to match which circumstances so that we can achieve those different goals. This is a little map that I'm trying to put together just of examples that I know about in the Indo-Pacific areas that I work. I look forward to hearing more and being able to, to add to my map. You can see that a carbon market mechanism is really growing in interest. Blue bonds are starting to be deployed. There are various others in development that I look forward to hearing about. So there's many opportunities for action. And this is a much more complete version of the diagram I showed earlier. It is in the Coastal Development Report 
Uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to, to have a look at it and perhaps look at the options and how they might be relevant to your system. Everything from, as we were saying earlier, from the protection through to restoration and even considering how we use infrastructure development, even on urban coasts as a way of actually achieving our goals. So what I would like to encourage you as, a, as my concluding comments is to think about moving from this degradation that Noelle highlighted in her opening comments to regeneration. And by regeneration, I also mean moving beyond sustainability. So in 1972, so 50 years ago, was the first UN conference on, on the environment where sustainability was really talked about quite seriously. That's 50 years ago that we've, and since then we've been working on sustainability. Now we need to talk about regeneration, moving beyond sustainable use to regenerative use. And if we do that, I think it's fundamental to these issues, not just of achieving sustainability goals, but of equity goals. And it'll provide the foundation for us to address multiple problems from climate mitigation to these large scale extreme event risks and also livelihoods, which have been mentioned earlier and also the World Economic Forum highlighted as, as one of the major risks that, we're, that we face. How do we do it? We have options and it is possible. We can build better and we can build better through climate resilient infrastructure, whether it's blue, whether it's green. We can expand the rate and scale of ecological restoration. We, we do know how to do it. We're getting better all the time. We just need to ex expand the rate at which we are doing it. Of course, as many people before me have said, stopping some of the harmful subsidies and perverse uses is gonna be important as, as well as empowering some of the marginalized communities to participate in not only acting, but in the decision-making. Investing, of course, is gonna be foundational. We need to invest wisely in sustainable and regenerative infrastructure. The ADB has a great role to play. It's got an action plan for healthy oceans, which is, which is a very fine, fine um, piece of work. And the coasts and the oceans of the ADB region are really well suited to this. It's a hot spot for corals, for mangroves, for seagrasses, for so many things. And, and so far, it's still there. So there's opportunities to avoid making the same mistakes that have been made elsewhere. And so by supporting the, the sectors and the actors, all those um, different components, as I say, from governments to NGOs to communities and, and the research sector, we can uh, deploy and scale up some of these. We do know how to do it. Um, it's time time to start implementing them. So you uh, are you uh, with with that I'll leave this slide up just for a second. Um, so folk are welcome to contact me via email or we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the web page if, if desired. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for bringing us an in-depth look at how to take on the Blue Road. Very thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Um, so speaking of also the increasing risks that the coastal areas are facing, we all think naturally of insurance tools. Our second presentation will be given by Josh Lane, as a fund manager of Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund at Cliff. Um, Josh is also a climate specialist at ADB. He has long experience uh, working on the topics of disaster risk financing and financial inclusion through World Food Program, Mercy Corps, World Bank, and international labor organization, and also insurance sector. So Josh, great to have you here today. Please, now you have the floor. Thank you very much, Yu Yu. Um, and thanks everyone for, for having me for this presentation. So I, I think uh, Matt presented a very interesting background to, to lead into this presentation because I will give a very specific example of a use of a finance tool to support nature and nature-based solutions, referring specifically to insurance and risk transfer solutions. 
and we'll present some examples of the work that ACLIF, the Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund, um, and also ADB is, is working on in this area. So to briefly give an overview of my presentation, um, to take a step back, I will give some background on the work of the Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund, or ACLIF, and then talk about the issue of ensuring nature. Why do we do it? What do we do? And exactly how do we do it in practice? So as a context for ACLIF, uh, the, the Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund, um, I note, and, and as many of you are probably aware, Asia and the Pacific is responsible for more than half of greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the pathways to limit these emissions are, are really going to be transformative across a number of sectors. It's a region that's also highly prone to disaster risk. And most of these losses are uninsured, talking about both nature and otherwise. And it's also a sector where the region's population is highly dependent in their work and otherwise uh, on sectors that are impacted by climate risks. So all in all, we have an urgent need to invest in climate change mitigation and adaptation, but the gap between what is the actual climate investment and what is needed is quite large. And ACLIF is trying to address this gap. ACLIF is a multi-donor trust fund that's managed by ADB. It was established with initial support from the government of Germany, and it aims to use financial risk management products to scale up climate investment in ADB's projects. It was established in 2017, and as I mentioned, it supports the development and implementation of financial risk management products with the aim of unlocking investments into the climate space. And the financial risk management products supported by the fund fit one of the following criteria, and in many instances fit more than one of these criteria. And it can be to help scale up the adoption of climate technologies, to mobilize new sources of climate financing from the private sector, and to support investment into climate sensitive sectors of the economy, uh, such as agriculture, water, fisheries, and also to address the impacts of extreme weather events. So the type of solutions that we will talk about today and that I will present in the next few slides really talk about how do we support investment into climate sensitive sectors of the economy, uh, such as the ocean economy, and how do we address the impacts of stream weather events on, uh, on these sectors. So why do we want to ensure nature and nature based solutions. Well, I think Matt gave a very good background as to why nature is so important. I'll focus specifically on the examples of marine coastal ecosystems, which provide a range of services to individuals, to businesses, to governments and other stakeholders. And these are individuals, businesses that may be coastal businesses, but maybe not given the, the interrelation of, of economic relationships. Um, the, the marine coastal ecosystems have a role in supporting livelihoods, they obviously contribute to the overall economy. And also importantly, as, as Matt mentioned, they support disaster risk reduction. They actually have a role to play in reducing disaster risk. And it's, it's this point that I will touch on further with an example. So we really have an incentive to preserve and maintain these ecosystems, given their importance to, to all of us. Uh, but like other assets, they're also exposed to risks of damage. So we also need to find ways to protect them in these ways. To give some, some more examples of some of the services provided by marine coastal ecosystems, uh, they provide provisioning services such as food, such as energy, fuel wood. They also provide regulating services um, such as resilience or, or regulation of water and soil quality. They provide cultural services, including for, for tourism, for recreation or religious enrichment. And they provide supporting services as well um, around soil formation, water cycling, and so on. 
So to focus specifically on the role of nature and nature-based solutions in, in, uh, in reducing disaster risk, I have two examples here of coral reefs and, and mangroves as, as marine coastal ecosystems, both of which have a role to play in reducing wave energy and, and height. Uh, for the example of coral reef ecosystems, they reduce the annual expected damages from storms by more than $4 billion per year. Mangroves provide 65 billion in flood protection and prevent flooding from affecting 15 million people annually. But these are just some estimates. And, and I also noticed that some of the estimates in, in Matt's presentation were actually even higher estimates than, than what's quoted here. Again, why is it important to, to ensure these nature solutions? It is expected that by 2050, 800 million people in coastal areas will be at risk from the impacts of extreme weather events, such as rising seas and storm surges. And the expected annual cost is expected to be more than $1 trillion to coastal urban areas, particularly as urban development continues to expand. So the importance of protecting these marine coastal ecosystems, providing disaster risk reduction benefits is very, very clear. But the capacity, for instance, of coral reefs, focusing on this example to provide disaster risk reduction is at risk. Coral reefs are, are being lost due to a number of threats uh, to which they are exposed, such as the, the high sea surface temperatures causing bleaching, uh, habitat loss and degradation due to unsustainable coastal development, pollution or careless tourism, overfishing, as well as the last point, natural hazards where storms, earthquakes, volcanic ash flows, and other natural hazards are a risk to the, the ongoing uh, or, or a risk to the existence of, of coral reefs. So a comprehensive approach to risk management is urgently needed for these marine coastal ecosystems to ensure that coral reefs uh, and other forms of nature can continue to provide the services that they do, including disaster risk reduction. So what type of solution are we looking at? Well, insurance can provide part of the solution in that it is an important tool in providing finance for restoration and conservation. Insurance against insurable risks has the ability to provide a, a rapid payout, rapid financing in the event of a large climate event, for example. A type of insurance that's often used in this context is parametric insurance. Parametric insurance is a specific type of insurance that differs from traditional insurance, where traditional insurance pays based on what is deemed to be an assessed loss after a large event, or, or let's say in the example of climate risk insurance, traditional insurance pays an amount uh, equivalent to the loss caused by a climate event. A parametric insurance provides predetermined payouts based on specified magnitudes of an insured event. To give a very specific example, Rainfall, for instance, could be measured in terms of the number of milliliters per day. So 100 milliliters, 200 milliliters, or 300 milliliters of rainfall within a 24 hour period could be deemed to be specific magnitudes for which an insurance product would provide different levels of payout. The advantage of this type of insurance is that it can be rapidly dispersing. Uh, funds are transferred immediately after a recorded event. There is no need for a specific loss assessment, but rather once a, a particular magnitude uh, of event is recorded, a payout can be released immediately. If these payout events, sorry, if these payout amounts are known in advance, this also allows for better planning and preparation of repair and restoration work. If, if the, the exact dollar amount is known for different events, sorry, different magnitudes of a climate event, 
then planning can be made with that specific budget to be ready for repair and restoration work of a coral reef, for instance. To give one specific example, this was one of the first examples of how this type of structure works. And it's from Quintana Roo in Mexico, where insurance is one piece of a comprehensive risk management approach and is combined with other risk financing tools. Insurance is not the only financing solution that's, that's implemented here. In this particular example, uh, a coral reef is, is insured off the coast of Mexico and the municipality pays money into a trust fund. So a fund is established and this fund is used to support the annual restoration and maintenance costs of the coral reef. So the trust fund contracts services for reef restoration, maintenance and resilience needs. And with regular contributions into the trust fund, the trust fund is also used for these regular costs of restoration and, and maintenance and resilience of the coral reef. But additionally, the trust fund purchases one of these parametric catastrophe insurance products. So parametric insurance for large climate events. And in the event that there is a large climate event that affects the, the region or the geographic area that the coral reef is in, the event then triggers an, a parametric insurance payout which is complemented into the trust fund, is paid into the trust fund and provides additional funding for what is immediate reef repair work above and beyond what is needed on a regular basis. So insurance is providing additional financing for events that are high in severity, but low in frequency and, and support the uh, financial cost of repairing reef in this event. The hotels and communities that are in the area, so I mentioned the, the benefit or, or rather the importance of marine coastal ecosystems for businesses. In this case, hotels, but also the local communities benefit from the payout as the reef that they depend on is uh, restored and uh, continues to, to exist in the form that it was before the livelihoods from uh, individuals that are in the area are also protected should they be dependent on the reef for their, their livelihoods. And obviously in the case of Mexico, tour, tour, tourism is a very significant um, part of what the coral reef contributes to and that's also protected. So how do we go about implementing such a solution? Um, well, the design of a sustainable insurance scheme to protect a marine coastal ecosystem relies upon a number of factors. Um, and this is, this is based on some of the examples that exist in the world, but also a project that ACLIF undertook recently um, to investigate such models. So it's important that the services provided by the coral reef must be quantifiable. Um, and so the first step into developing this type of scheme is to quantify what these services are. And in the case of disaster risk reduction, I provided some examples of the, the dollar figures as to how much protection these types of marine coastal ecosystems provide on a global basis. Um, and this would need to be calculated for a specific example. The owners or the beneficiaries of these services must be identified. In the previous example, this was the, the hotel businesses that existed on the coast. It was the local communities and the individuals that benefited from, um, from having the coral reef there. The risks that threaten the coral reefs must also be insurable. So in the case of large climate events, that's, that's usually the case. Other risks such as overfishing, for instance, would not be insurable as they have a human influence on their occurrence. And insurance should be seen as a cost efficient tool to restore and protect. Um, if not, if it's not seen as, as cost efficient, then it may be more efficient to simply continue contributing additional funding into the trust fund on an annual basis, um, instead of also purchasing an, an insurance product and paying an insurance premium. 
and a series of minimum enabling factors must be present in the country where the insurance scheme will be developed. Um, there needs to be, for instance, a, a, an insurance market that is able to, to offer these types of products. And perhaps it does involve support from uh, a project team such as ADB, for instance, who is working on this in Asia and the Pacific to help build the initial product. Uh, but there needs to be an insurance sector that is able to hold the risk. So to provide a, a brief example, ACLIF, uh, the Asia Pacific Climate Finance Fund that I mentioned, is supporting an ADB project to develop coral reef finance and insurance solutions in four countries in the region. And I mentioned that because both finance and insurance are part of the solution. They're, as I mentioned, there can be um, ways that uh, different types of risk finance tools are layered together to either provide annual benefits for uh, restoration and, and repair work, as well as insurance for low frequency and high severity events. This is being implemented in four countries, the Philippines, Fiji, Solomon Islands, and Indonesia, and will involve a collaboration between coastal tourism businesses, government agencies, the insurance industry in each of those countries, as well as global reinsurance companies, academia, local scientists, and community organizations, amongst others. And this project will uh, support the growing examples of uh, demonstrating a business case for coral reef maintenance and restoration funds supported by insurance risk transfer solutions. And so when I mentioned that this aims to be a sustainable insurance um, and demonstrate a business case, it's really that there is beneficiaries and owners of the, the coral reef system that are identified and that are willing to contribute towards the, the payments into a restoration fund and also the purchase of an insurance product to protect against low frequency and high severity events. That's the end of my presentation. Um, happy to take any questions as we move to the question and answer session. Thank you. Very interesting and a very informative presentation. Thank you, Josh. And uh, you give some real life examples, which is very inspiring. So yeah, I do also feel that this is an area of huge potential if the insurers can get to grips of the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem function, the sectors really can make a lot of change. So with that, um, let's start our first Q&A session for two minutes. We already have two questions posted in the Q&A box. Um, the first one is about are any habitats better than other in terms of coastal protection from storm surges and et cetera? Where do you see intertidal mud flats and these are not NDC qualifying habitats, but are important for many species and supporting livelihood through shellfish harvesting? I think this question is more meant for um, Matt. Matt, if you can still share us yeah. on that question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. Um, thanks for the for the question. In fact, I think there's two questions there. One one in terms of the the coastal protection, and I think when you think about coastal protection, and think about when there's a an extreme event, say a, a, a tropical storm, it creates waves, but also it creates surge to minimize the effects of those you need to stop the energy associated with those so you need to to have something that slows the water down reefs do a really good job of that coastal reefs like coral reefs shellfish reefs offshore they're very effective and then onshore mangroves are particularly useful highly structured and they create friction that slows the water down then tidal wetlands and NDC, so nationally determined contributions. In fact, you can put tidal wetlands in your NDC if you want to, noting that we don't think at the moment that there's a, there's a sequestration 
possibility for tidal wetlands. We don't, with the, we don't know for sure that the carbon that's going into those wetlands is, is sequestered for long term. So it's not about mitigation, but tidal wetlands can certainly be included as part of your adaptation activities. As you say, there's also other benefits to them. Um, for example, habitat and livelihood. So I would encourage you if you if you think that you have tidal tidal mud flats, for example, without vegetation, they're important. Then please do look at uh, including them as part of an adaptation measure. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Matt. And our second question, we have well in total three questions here, and we're expecting for more. For audience who want to raise question, please uh, click this Q and A box, and you can raise questions there, where you can just raise your hands, and I can uh, call on you. Um, so the second question is: uh, It is still a challenge to get governments to spend money on nature, whether restoration or other, when they are also dealing with poverty. Oh, I think that one is already answered online. Oh, not yet. Oh, okay, let me continue. So how can we get a, get a change the mindset? Is blending of finance with grants a good way to make a better business case for investment? So I'll turn the floor to George and Matt. Uh, who of you would like to share your thoughts first, please? I, I can add a quick thought, which I think, uh, Speaking specifically about the insurance example, I mentioned that the, one of the first steps is really to quantify the benefits of nature. Um, and, and in the case of an insurance, largely that's a quantifying a dollar amount. Um, but taking that first step, I think, helps to advocate for the value that nature is providing, whether it's in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, the disaster protection that it provides, Sorry, <clears throat> whether it's the disaster protection that it provides um, or the benefits that it's providing to coastal businesses and individuals. Um, but that's not always an obvious figure. And so part of this insurance work that we realize will have uh, flow on benefits into other areas is really quantifying exactly what are the benefits provided by nature in this particular case. And like perhaps if I can add, add to what Josh has said, I, I just note that poverty alleviation and coastal regeneration uh, are not separate. They are very tightly linked. We, we can't expect somebody who's really thinking on a daily basis about where they're getting their food from to be participating in a restorative and regenerative um, coastal system. They have other more urgent priorities. So poverty alleviation is, is a reasonable first priority, but also they're linked in the sense that we are going to be able to better alleviate poverty in general if we have a pro productive system that supports fisheries, that supports uh, food production of various kinds, and also provides a source of revenue to allow education to break out of the poverty trap. So those things are important. In, in terms of blending finance with grants, yes, certainly. If there's, there's a big role for, for in terms of a, a risky kind of investment to, to take some of the, the risk out of it, the risk for the investor, that is, by, by deploying grants at an early stage to, to you know, provide a proof of concept, for example, or readiness. So those are those are good ideas, I think, on top of what Josh has said. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I do agree that it is not our first priority to change the mindset of the habitats who live in poverty and around the coastal line. This may be our priority to, on how to provide support uh, for those areas to realize this uh, transformational change. So our third question is for Josh. Josh, um, what do you feel are the top three barriers to setting up a coral reef insurance system in the region? Please, Josh. That's a great question. And I think the answer that I provided to the previous question might be one of them, is that there, there doesn't exist a, a quantification of the benefits that, uh, 
that nature provides in many of these instances. And so um, in that sense, um, the first step is, is really quantifying what those benefits are, having, having that known um, by all. And then also, I think the challenge is really creating a, a model where those that are benefiting from the, the nature, let's say the coral reef in this instance, um, develops a, a model where they're willing to contribute financially towards the, the, the maintenance and the restoration of that reef. So in the case of Mexico, there was a very clear example where if the coral reef didn't exist in, in that coastal area, hotels presumably would not benefit from the tourism that they do because the tourism is, is attracted to a large extent by the, the coral reef. They have a very clear incentive to pay um, or contribute financially towards the protection of that, that reef. And I think in other instances, it's not always as clear, or it may be a, a form of nature where there are a number of stakeholders that are benefiting, not only businesses, but individuals, government, uh, but not all of them will have the right incentives um, to be able to contribute or, or to be willing to contribute financially, or they may not be able to contribute financially. So it may be low-income communities that are dependent on nature and, and in that sense um, don't have the financial means to be able to contribute to this type of model. So in summary, the, the top three would be that uh, in many instances, the benefits are, are not quantified um, and that in some instances, those that benefit don't have an ability to pay uh, for a type of financial solution. Uh, and then in some instances, there isn't a willingness or, or an incentive for them to pay. And sometimes there's a need for uh, improved policies to ensure that they are uh, contributing. Thank you, uh, Josh. Um, wonderful question and wonderful answer. So in fourth question is also, this was for Matt. Matt, as you mentioned, scaling up of coastal protection and restoration is already happening. Can you share examples of this, if possible, for cases where it's taking place across national boundaries following a regional approach? Matt? Yes, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, well, I'll start with mangroves. Mangroves have really been planted at scale since the 1960s. We've got more than 50 years of knowledge on, on how to plant mangroves. Um, and it's now being done routinely at um, tens to hundreds of hectares, even thousands of hectares. And, and there are carbon offset mechanisms set up financing large scale mangrove reforestation. So, so that's happening. Um, we also can do marsh ecosystems. There's, there's a number of examples in North America and in Australia that I know about where we're restoring natural tidal cycles. It's helping bring the marshes back. Seagrasses, there's a wonderful example in the US of hundreds of hectares of seagrass that's been returned through, through restoration techniques. Shellfish reefs, similarly. Corals we're working on, not by planting out individual corals, which is hard work and not always successful, but by using larvae and, and capturing and dispersing larvae in a way that it really enhances the survival. So these things are happening. They're usually happening within countries. So there aren't very many of examples of a, of a regional approach with a cross boundary restoration. The closest that I can think of is, is mangrove restoration in, in East Africa, which, which is crossing the boundary of Kenya and, and Tanzania. I don't know very much about that one, um, but certainly there's, there's lots of possibilities to explore there. That would, that would certainly be a wonderful way forward. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Matt. We have one minute left, and I think we can take one more question. And this one is for Josh. Uh, for any answered question, I think you can, all the audience, you can find um, the email address of Josh and Matt in the chat. In the chat, and you can help always hunt them down with your burning questions if you wish. So, last question for Josh: How far along are we in having the data and information about the values and economic contributions of different ecosystems? Or is this a big limitation developing this insurance product? You have the floor, 
Thank you. I, I think there's two parts of that question. One is how far are we along in having the, the data and information about these economic contributions? And I think at an aggregate level, um, it's, it's becoming more known, or at least there's growing awareness of the importance of these, uh, these ecosystems, of these marine coastal ecosystems into the economy, into businesses and, and communities um, at a very high level. And then the second part is, is this a big limitation in developing these insurance products? And I would say it's it's that awareness that creates a, a demand or, or sees the, the need for these types of solutions. But in terms of having the exact data for developing an insurance product typically involves doing a more thorough analysis of the exact ecosystem in the exact geography that, that the insurance would be set up. So let's say an example of hotels uh, protecting a, a coral reef um, in that particular geographical area, perhaps there needs to be a more thorough analysis, a very technical analysis of exactly what are the benefits of coral reef in let's say a 20 kilometer stretch of coast and the insurance product analysis would also require um, details about exactly how much does that coral reef protect that coastal area from um, storm events that are meant to happen once every 20 years, once every 50 years, once every 100 years. And so it's it's also much more detailed information that is needed to be able to, for instance, set those trigger levels on a parametric insurance product um, for different levels of severity of climate events to determine exactly what type of payout would be needed based on the calculated or estimated damage of that coral reef. Um, so in terms of the design of the insurance, there's always a need for much more technical details, but at a higher level, I think the awareness of the value is, is growing. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. I know you have to sign off. Thank you very much for being here with, with us here today. And Max, if you can stay with us till the end, much appreciated. And now let's, uh, I know there are probably more questions, let's table them for later. So thanks for all the questions and answers. We have two more very interesting presentation on our agenda and let me turn it over to CC. Well, CC is consultant and a legal wildlife trade coordinator at ADB. She's experienced a matter of illegal wildlife trade alongside marine conservation with a focus on marine turtles, also one of my favorite animals. She has led and assisted in numerous initiatives and research projects on wildlife conservation and trafficking in the region. So Sissy, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Yu Yu. Let me share my screen. Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Steffi Fisher. Um, I'm your legal wildlife trade coordinator for ADB. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I will be presenting on tools and techniques to detect illegal wildlife trade in seaports and airports. I will start with illegal wildlife trade and underestimated threat. A few years ago, there was a report that was published by an international scientific body, which stated that as much as 1 million species face extinction. And for that, there are two main drivers. The first one is land and sea use change, meaning habitat destruction. And the second one is direct exploitation. And illegal wildlife trade falls under that, as well as unsustainable and unregulated trade and catch such as overfishing. And together, these two drivers account for more than 50% of the global impact on land, in freshwater, and in the sea. By now, IWT, illegal wildlife trade, is already the fourth largest illegal trade globally, after arms, drugs, and human trafficking. And the value, the annual value of IWT is seven to 23 billion dollars. So that means there's a huge environmental impact because the natural balance is disturbed, 
the prey predator relationships change, keystone species disappear, and a natural selection is disrupted. And one example that illustrates that quite well is actually the ivory trade. So there was a study um, conducted on ivory trading in Mozambique, where it was used to finance a civil war. And before the war, about 18% of female elephants were naturally tactless, a trade that makes them undesirable to poachers. And that fraction increased to 33%. So the selective killing of elephants with tusks led to the birth of tuskless offspring. And that's an issue because tusk and tuskless animals, they eat different plants. And seeing that elephants are this keystone species that can change the, um, the whole landscape. And for males, this is even worse because the tuskless trade is fatal. So it means that fewer elephants, elephants in general will be born overall, which could slow population recovery. The question then is, but how does that affect us? The more species disappear, the more people lose their sources of food, which leads to poverty. There are a lot of communities that depend on wildlife and they lose their livelihoods, such as, such as uh, tourism related income, which again leads to poverty. Poverty, in turn, is one of the most important drivers for poaching, leading to the aforementioned environmental impacts and thus a vicious cycle starts. Also, the government lose revenue through foregone profits and money laundering and civil unrest becomes more likely. There have even been reports that terrorist groups such as Boko Haram are involved in IWT to finance their operations. So national security is affected as well. And last but not least, each one of us has been experiencing one of the most serious impacts directly over the last two years because human health is affected. Irresponsible human wildlife interactions that we see, for instance, in wet markets increase the risk of emerging zoonotic diseases and spread to humans. So IWT affects all of us and it affects ADB, which is why we need to recognize the threat as what it is, a serious organized crime. ADB has undertaken numerous efforts to counteract this development, most notably um, implemented a project together with the Philippine Department on Environment and Natural Resources on combating environmental organized crime in the Philippines. In addition, we developed an IWT project map and database. We published several reports, like IWT at the Philippine Southeast Asian Nexus and implications of a wildlife trade ban. We entered into partnerships with the World Bank, USAID, and WWF on advancing a counter wildlife trafficking development partner platform for Asia. We're strengthening the capacity of judges and prosecutors for IWT related cases. We're working together with national banks in revising the information submitted in suspicious transaction reports and we're collaborating with the End Pandemics Alliance to address the drivers of and prevent the next pandemic. We also conducted port mate assessments in seven Philippine seaports, which brings us to green sustainable infrastructure development. So in this presentation, I'll focus on seaports and airports and tools and techniques used to detect illegal wildlife trade because environmentally sustainable infrastructure preserves the natural environment, which includes the detection of illicit goods such as smuggled wildlife. Just to talk briefly about IWT trade flows and points of entry and exit, um, it's important to note that IWT is a transboundary crime and there is a strong emphasis on trade between Africa, mostly source countries and Asia, mostly transit and destination countries. And these points of entry and exit can be land borders, sea borders and airports each with their own challenges, of course. This is why by now there are elaborate methods of concealment that are applied by poachers. There have been reports of parrot trade within Asia where birds are stuffed into pet bottles. There have been reports of ivory and pangolin scales that are concealed in wooden crates that look like timber logs and are hidden within wax. And there have been reports of freshwater turtles taped to the insides of checked in suitcases. So just to give you an impression, this is how it looks like. So here we have cockatoos that were stuffed into pet bottles and then smuggled across the border. 
these are these fake logs that are used to conceal, um, in this case, ivory and pangolin scales. And these are the turtles that were taped to the insides of suitcases. So these methods require us to rethink and to build seaport and airport infrastructure and tools to efficiently and effectively detect smuggled goods and thus to deter criminals from using these points of entry and exit. And that does not only refer to illegal wildlife trade, but also to legal wildlife trade because 11.6 million individual live wild animals were exported from 2012 to 2016. Here you can see an illustration of one of the trafficking flows reported origins. Um, so this is for pangolin scales between 2007 to 2018. That's from the Unity Sea World crime report. And the pangolin, which you can see here to the right, is the most trafficked mammal worldwide. And it's mostly trafficked because of uh, the use of its scales for medicinal purposes. And it's also consumed as a delicacy. And this bears a lot of risks for the transport sector risks, legal risks, economic risks, health and safety risks, and security risks. I'll go on to talk a bit about seaports. Um, so 72 to 90% of wildlife products are trafficked by sea because it's cost effective, it's, it's possible to ship large quantities, and there's a low likelihood of detection. And of course, we have the enabling condition of a network of corrupt actors. The key infrastructure gaps are a lack of comprehensive automatic systems at the ports for risk profiling of containers, specifically before the cargo is loaded. This means there is no advanced information um, from shipment bookings and electronic export import documents provided. It's only provided to customs once the containers have been loaded onto the ship and then they're unavailable for inspection. There's a lack of secure examination facilities within the port to guard, open, and inspect containers. There's a lack of non-intrusive technologies such as um, scanning, sniffer dogs, and weighing of containers at the port to uncover anomalies in provided documentation. There's a lack of secure reporting systems for suspicious cargo and risks of leaks through corrupt officials. And there's no system in place to assert the authenticity or legitimacy of documentation submitted. Because of these issues, this has been high on the international agenda. And in May 2022, so very recently, the International Maritime Organization adopted new guidelines for the prevention and suppression of the smuggling of wildlife on ships engaged in international maritime traffic. So this sends a strong message on growing international engagement against IWT and encourages governments to adopt numerous measures, for instance, to promote transparency and deter the misuse of free trade zones. And to further strengthen law enforcement in this regard, IMO is currently also developing an IWT course together with WWF and the World Maritime University. So what can we do? What are the tools that we have um, at our disposal? The first step, is a baseline assessment. And this is where PortMate comes in. The port monitoring and anti-trafficking tool was developed by UNDP. And it's a framework to conduct rapid assessments of the capacity of international ports. It can be adjusted to domestic ports as well. In preventing, detecting, and intercepting illicit trafficking activities. So this is a self-assessment tool with 52 questions with rating from zero to three points for establishing a baseline and also for monitoring it in the subsequent years. One example question would be, are standard operating procedures developed and implemented for container, cargo, baggage inspection, and seizure of wildlife and other illicit goods? The analysis of the results then provides an overview of the key gaps that are identified. And these need to be factored in when investing into port infrastructure to ensure that efforts to protect the environment can be maximized. The second step is to identify red flags. The Red Flag Indicator Companion was published by WWF and Traffic in 2021 
and it raises awareness at customs level of the most common red flag indicators for illegal wildlife trade through containerized sea cargo. Examples are that the shipment of commodities is incongruous with origin and or destination country, that a consignment is split across multiple shipments, that there was a last minute request for shipment clearance, possibly the value of the cargo does not tally with the description or with the size. Maybe there has been a change of shipping route once the ship has already left port, or there has been a switched bill of lading when the shipment is already on road to obfuscate the information about the port of loading, so the origin, the port of discharge, the destination, and the routing of the shipment. There are also red flags regarding known trafficking routes and ports of interest that have been implicated in the past. So there was a toolkit developed by Themis together with the WWF and the UK government. And there you can um, have a look at geographical red flags. How to detect these? So one efficient way to do that is to make use of electronic systems of innovative technologies and artificial intelligence. And this is where some of the technology examples come in. We had a risk profile tool, which was developed by Vietnam and used by the UNODC WCO Container Control Program. This one handles and analyzes large and multiple data sets on containers, containees, cargo names, and category definitions. And it allows an effective risk profiling of thousands of containers in a few minutes and can thus detect suspicious containers that need inspection. Another tool is the Nature Intelligence System, and this one automatically analyzes shipment paperwork and can thus identify questionable shipments and anomalies based on scanned historical shipping data. And third, we have the NABIT, which is a nucleic acid barcode identification tool. So currently using genetic information for species confirmation requires the use of laboratory, expensive equipment, and scientists and technicians with specialized training. And the NABIT changes that because it's used to validate the identity of a wildlife or food product via a portable DNA detection device, which can provide a result within 30 minutes. So how about airports? Airports are used by smugglers as an efficient option when they look to move wild animals or wildlife products quickly. And large international airports with lax custom screening procedures, but many connecting flights are at the highest risk. Screening on departure and in transit is primarily done for security purposes, so it's not focused on trafficking. Screening on arrival is designed to uncover trafficking, but it's focused on revenue and agricultural disease protection instead. And the issue is that wildlife traffickers, they rely on the same weaknesses and loopholes within airports exploited by criminals of all types. So also by criminals on trafficking drugs or, or arms or um, other illicit goods. So the airports can use this information actually to strengthen their enforcement in general. And this can also, like, if it's not addressed, it can also put the health of humans and other animals at risk, for instance, by venomous animals or by infestations. And this has severe implications for the airport infrastructure. And one example that I would like to give was the discovery of rotten bushmeat, uh, meaning African primate, porcupine, and antelope from Nigeria in the Cologne airport in Germany in December last year. There were 15 parcel shipments that were seized. They were on their way to private individuals in Germany, France, and Belgium. And they were infested with molds and maggots. And this is how it looked like. And that's not nice. And it was so bad that the airport border control point of the city of Cologne will be destroyed. So that means we need to have a focus both on the airport of origin for these products that not to be sent in the first place, but also in the airport of destination, like this one, because there should be facilities to safely unpack these items without affecting health or infrastructure. There should be a close collaboration with vets and forensic experts and a repository of appropriate protective equipment and of other items such as anti-venoms, for instance, for the most commonly traded snakes. 
It's important also to raise awareness among airlines, which is what the United for Wildlife Transport Task Force does, which is a partnership with businesses from the transport sector to identify and develop targeted solutions to wildlife trafficking. The basis, therefore, is the Buckingham Palace Declaration. There are several companies that signed up, British Airways, DHL, um, Dubai Airports, Hong Kong Airport, Sydney Airport. So there are a lot of um, companies and airports that signed on. And in addition to that, there are various tools provided by the Airport Council, the National or ACI, such as best practice guidelines, um, e-learning trainings and videos that can be used. In addition, we need to raise awareness among passengers, meaning through passenger campaigns, airline designs, billboards, in-flight awareness raising, activities in terminals and social media. And how this can look like, you can see here. So um, at the bottom left, we have a video for aviation staff. We have an in-flight magazine from the Netherlands. At the top, we have a display on how animals could be smuggled in Johannesburg at the airport. To the right, you can see a billboard from the Naya airport in Manila. And at the bottom, you can see an Emirates plane um, that displays place different threatened species to raise awareness. One best practice example for improved infrastructure was done by the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Kenya. The challenges that the airport faced was that the systems for detection of wildlife products at the airport were not sophisticated enough. And the judicial process for wildlife trafficking cases was very lengthy. So what the airport did is that it pushed for the creation of a court of law inside the airport in order to allow cases to be heard faster and also make the sentencing process quicker. It introduced a rescreening of all transit bags and cargo by the security team on targeted routes. It houses a canine unit at the airport, meaning sniffer dogs. And it developed a standard operating procedure and allowed unobstructed access to the Kenya Wildlife Services. So what are the conclusions? First, combating illegal wildlife trade should be recognized as an important element when discussing about greening infrastructure and making the transport sector more sustainable. And the loopholes in seaports and airports are equally exploited to smuggle life, wildlife and wildlife products, which means this has severe consequences for the environment, the economy and human well-being and health. Second, ports of entry and exit require baseline assessments to identify the challenges that are, they are facing before improving their infrastructure accordingly. Knowing red flags and using advanced technology to detect those can really make a large difference in combating wildlife trafficking. And this will help curb not only wildlife crime, but other forms of crime too. And we really need to keep this in mind. So infrastructure should also be complemented, of course, by efficient interagency collaboration real-time data and intelligence sharing systems, and airline staff and passenger awareness raising and capacity building. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very valid point and strong cases. I think if the first two presentations showed us the ways to build green and blue infrastructures and then that benefits in the coastal areas, CISIS cases, on the other hand, has stressed out the important roles of the seaports playing in conserving coastal ecosystems and very suspicious, especially on the wildlife uh, trafficking and crime. And also know that the ports are also very uh, critical facilities in conservation in terms of inv invasive alien species. Um, so thank you, Cece. And let's bring us to our last presentation um, from from our last speaker, Russell Stevens. Um, Russell, uh, hi, uh, Russell is the principal marine scientist of Ports in O2 Marine. And um, he has over 15 years of experience in ports industry and environmental management, both in Australia and Southeast Asia. And he is also with significant experience in policy making, conducting audits and inspections in this field. We can't find a better role, uh, a better suitable speaker than Russell to introduce the regional development in port industry. Please, Russell, you have the floor. Thank you, Yu. 
just uh, shared my screen. I hope the uh, slide package is visible to all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for the uh, Green Coastal Development Session of the Green Road to Kunming. Um, yeah, as you said, my name is Russell Stevens, and I work as a principal marine scientist for uh, O2 Marine. Um, my session explores environmental impacts associated with ports to a lesser extent shipping within select Southeast Asian countries. I have presented an overview of some key findings obtained as a result from a pilot study conducted for the ADB in collaboration with my colleague Adrian Sammons from Amstead. By way of background, ports and shipping are responsible for uh, quite a, um, a large sector of the um, global greenhouse gas emissions um, through maritime transport, which is currently around two to three percent and estimated to increase to up to or over 17 percent by 2050 if unchecked. Um, various solutions are, are, are available to, um, to different ports and shipping at the moment, but my focus isn't typically on this today. Um, in terms of environmental impacts from ports and shipping activities, they are very wide and diverse. We have air emissions, water and air quality uh, impacts, noise, vibration, we have liquid and solid waste um, production, uh, and contaminants to the marine environment, light pollution, and then there's other activities such as dredging, which has its own environmental impacts. Um, within the port itself, uh, the landside activities, we have lots of different um, operations occurring around trucks and trains, feeder ships, uh, all contributing to um, carbon dioxide. Um, our focus or our pilot study typically explored the um, notion of greening of ports rather than the full spectrum of sustainability. So what I've put up here is just a couple of examples of what the actual difference is. So for a green port, what we looked at is the proactive development, execution and monitoring practice, practices target at reducing environmental effects beyond compliance. Port sustainability typically does similar to that, but also looks at the uh, human natural resources as well as financial impacts. Um, in the early part of our pilot study, we just undertook a, a desktop analysis. Um, one of the things we were interested to see is, is what are the pressures um, that port authorities or port, ports in general, uh, shipping would face um, as with yeah, going green. So some of the pressures we found are typically around regulation. So we've got international, we have international agreements. Uh, then we come down to national and uh, provincial or state type regulations. Then we have key stakeholders and the port city environment, which would be the port community where the ports uh, actually occur. Um, some interesting developments um, that we found, this comes from the ESPO 2020, and over a three year period, we can see climate change coming from a priority of 10 right up to priority of uh, two by 2020, um, amongst a whole um, range of different um, impacts and uh, priorities for ports to actually move towards greening. So we can see uh, air quality climate change quite high on the list of um, the priorities for worldwide ports to move towards greening. Um, how are the global ports responding? So worldwide, the leader would typically be the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are fundamentals to embed into greening and sustainability pathways for the future and not just of ports. Within the ports, there's the World Ports Sustainability Program, which has adopted the United Nations Development Goals. And this has also been embedded into some of their key founding partners such as uh, Ports Australia, ESPO, um, the Americas uh, Ports, and various others. So the objectives of our pilot study was, is quite wide, and I'll, I'll be only focusing on a typical couple of findings from the pilot studies. So what we set out to do is identify the range of environmental regulatory settings 
through which Southeast Asian ports are operating. We wish to define the scale and operations of various different port activities across the region. We also wish to explore the application of end compliance of port management within the select ports to their national environmental regulations or their own environmental management systems. We wished as an outcome of our findings to provide recommendations of an enhanced approach to the expanding needs for greater coverage and compliance environmental concerns emanating from seaport operations. Uh, this is just a quick little map which shows the ports. Um, so what we targeted was a cross section of large and small ports by throughput and activity as well as sort of spatial size. We also looked at different port um, operator models such as private or government ports. Um, and also we tried to target as wide a range of um, activities as we could, such as break bulk cargoes, container ports, uh, bulk ports or liquid bulk ports. Um, our study targeted four ports in Thailand, three ports in Indonesia and three ports in Vietnam. Um, Moving back to the previous slide, which was from um, our desktop analysis, our actual findings from the pilot study looked at the current pressures the ports are facing across the regions. And also we wanted to understand what their thoughts are for future pressures on greening. As we can see here, the current pressures on greening heavily focused towards the national environmental regulators with a small portion of the port city or the local urban, urban communities um, as well as the reputational um, and largely very small percent of the wider spectrum of what international ports are facing. However, when we looked at what they thought were the future pressures on greening, it changed quite rapidly. So the ports are identifying that the port, uh, the, the pressures for them to start using greener practices is actually coming from a very broad spectrum. So looking again, so the local community is quite strong there. Looking at port users, importers and exporters are starting to put pressure on the ports. Port users such as the shipping lines are also bringing their own pressures. Port associations, international agreements are continuing. And um, as we see, yes, it's just becoming much more um, identified that in the future, there will be increasing pressures for ports to green their practices. So that brings us to what are the challenges for Southeast Asian ports to embark on their green practices. So as we can see here, um, the reliance on external assistance was quite agreeable. Uh, the lack of a regional approach was very strongly agreed. So basically the ports are identifying that uh, they feel that, it, that there's no regional approach, rather than just your, um, so it's the national regulations or state or provincial regulations, rather than looking at a coordinated regional approach. Financial resources, again, quite strong um, as a current pressure, or sorry, a current challenge. Um, limited internal capacity. So we're looking at human resources, again, financial resources are linked quite heavily there, as well as the port's knowledge on how to progress towards a green, um, more green standards and a green approach. Uh, the guiding principles and standards, including regulations, again, quite agreed. Um, and was a question we asked, was there no pressures on going green, why bother? Um, that was more of a disagreement, which is a good thing. So there is an understanding out there that this uh, port greening is where ports need to progress to in the future through the ports that we have um, surveyed. Um, what we also wanted to look at is um, in terms of environmental management, um, looking at environmental management plans, more the strategic type of thing. Do, do ports have documented systems in place? We found very wide range across the different ports. So there's certainly some um, room for some improvement in this um, sort of part of the port uh, management without a clear focus or strategic direction on greening or sustainability as a whole, it's probably not gonna be a, an easy pathway to move forward without a 
a, a documented and agreed approach. Um, just a quick overview, we won't go into all of these into a huge amount of detail, but in terms of our recommendations for ports to become greener, we identified quite a, a raft of different, um, different options for ports across operational, so um, different ways that trucks and cargo and throughput can uh, enter and exit ports to maximise efficiencies looked at different technology. There's lots of software and um, other different things out there. Uh, we looked at infrastructure, certainly a very big aspect of our pilot study was looking at replacing old infrastructure with more modern um, environmentally friendly infrastructure. Um, behavioral, which comes down to a lot of training, education and procedural um, activities to uh, manage how ports and the people working within ports actually undertake their activities and then looking at resources. Are ports resourced um, efficiently to be able to get to these different standards that they wish to approach? So one of the key findings I think is most relevant to this session is what we identified is the lack of regional approach which also then covers off a lot of the other challenges around resourcing, um, knowledge gaps, and all these other um, challenges, as well as um, the financial um, resourcing side of things. So why, why would the regional approach um, be of a benefit? So first, we've, through having a regional approach, you could set up a, a governance body, which is typically responsible for establishing the regional uniform approaches on behalf of associated members to establishing green initiatives, setting the goals and objectives, as well as the targets. So kind of like identifying what the standards are for the region and then assisting ports to come along and meet those regions. A lobby group. So we talked before the current pressures are heavily focused towards uh, the national uh, regulation. So where the regulation is of benefit, that is fantastic, but also if the regulation is becoming a hindrance or the, the governance body felt that the regulation needs to be part of the push to provide green, actually having a, a coordinated approach allows this group to lobby government regarding environmental management and the greening port goals and objectives to ensure regulatory instruments are aligned with regional practices and do not cause the, any unnecessary burden for the ports. Um, it also provides a key platform for resource and knowledge sharing. Um, so basically through this regional approach or having a industry body, it allows the, um, each of the port staff members, particularly in the environment section, to share knowledge, um, share learnings, um, also cross-pollinate with other ports rather than trying to do everything on their own. There's also open opportunities for people to travel between ports, have a look at how other ports operate, take those learnings back and apply them to their ports. Uh, provides a key platform through which collaborative workshops, seminars, conferences and training can uh, occur across a wide discipline and across a large area. Um, this can be achieved through membership participation. It also reduces or is likely to reduce the resources required by singular ports, depending on how the regional approach can be structured for resource sharing. Um, for example, several resources may be responsible, therefore, for multiple ports, rather than just a person working at a single port, uh, provides transport economic efficiencies, whereby this ultimately reduces emissions through establishing better logistical regional chains. Port representative bodies typically look into three components of sustainability when approaching government strategies, such as financial, environmental, and operational. This typically uh, involves and includes the port city interface and should consider the UN sustainable development goals. It also provides a key benefit where the smaller ports, the less developed or far reaching areas can, Apologies, bump the button, um, can also benefit from the larger ports. They're all in this together. The larger ports generally are, are more advanced, have greater level of resources, and um, 
are able then to assist the smaller ports in uh, achieving their um, green objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you for picking up with time for this excellent presentation. You give us um, an example of provide an in-depth analyze of the challenges and also the gaps facing in this region in terms of ports construction. So uh, with that, we are entering into our second Q&A session. Um, let me check the Q&A box and we have two in the list. The first one is directed for CC. CC, very great to see the lightning getting better for you. <laughs> I can see your face right now. <laughs> Do you think the development banks are, going, are doing enough in bringing the IWT elements into their projects? Please. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. The sun was just coming up. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you for the question. Traditionally, I think I would say no. Um, but in 2015, the Global Wildlife Program, a uh, Global Wildlife Program was created, which is a Jeff Finance and World Bank led program, and that combines 37 projects in 32 countries. And I would say this was when the awareness reached a wider level in MDBs. And I think the issue is that it's not considered a core business of the banks. But when you look at the consequences of what can happen if you don't address IWT, then you see that they do indeed relate to the core business. And I think this has reached a whole new level of awareness also with regard to the One Health approach since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And also on the, on the international level, um, the Global Environment Facility will launch its eighth funding round this year. And one of its integrated programs will be on wildlife conservation for development. And ADB is currently assessing also how to assist countries under GIF-8. So I would say hopefully committing IWT will be there to stay and will have a permanent place at the table of MDBs. Thanks. Thank you, Sissi. So the second question, I'm going to turn to Russell. Um, it's on ADB do a lot of work on ports in the Pacific where invasive alien species are a major concern. Are there any key things that ADB should be thinking about in this respect? The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, um, it is a very much of a high level concern. Um, I think in terms of this one, the international bodies regulate the shipping quite well. Um, however, when the ships actually enter the, the regional water bodies, what the ADB could do to, um, to support or assist prevention is, is make sure that the um, international standards are being met. Um, again, it probably comes down to potentially not having the resources at the port to do thorough checks on ships prior to arrival, um, and making sure they're undertaking their ballast management, where was their previous port of call, um, do they do risk assessments on different vessels coming from different countries as, you know, as directed to what invasive species they may bring in. So, I think there are certainly some things that the ADB could do in this respect. However, I think it'd be just ensuring that the application of what the international bodies um, are sort of setting out are being ap applied and achieved through shipping. Um, probably not the greatest answer, but it's, it wasn't a key focus, so I guess, of our particular study. Um, we were looking at yeah, very much port standards and are they meeting those with regards to their sort of land side and, and that sort of thing. But yes, there's certainly things that ADB do, could do in terms of resourcing or assisting ports and port authorities through Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Thank you. And we have oh, two more questions for you. Uh, the third one will on ports that are often responsible directly or indirectly for coastal erosion, which is normally left to, call, to local authorities to manage. Was a solution for this investigation in your study, is it still a gap in the management process? Can you share your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yes, so our, our particular study didn't focus that um, at that granular level, looking at um, the particular aspects of the ports management. What we were looking at is more trying to identify um, using um, 
what we found is applicable port standards are very varied across the world in terms of sustainability or greening, um, quite heavily focused within all of the standards that we looked at that we could do a, a comparison of the ports and their environmental performance in terms of greening, uh, really looked at at the higher level, do they have um, environmental management systems? Are they ISO certified? Are they uh, implementing management? We didn't specifically look into the management at this level. Um, this is very much a high level pilot study. However, you're, um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. It's uh, something we see all around the world um, when ports are uh, being um, developed and built, uh, particularly all the, the current ones, probably more modern ones, this is now being taken into account through design. Um, but yeah, no, this is probably, I can't provide too much more from a Southeast Asian port, yeah, whether it's a gap, we just did not look down that, that far into that level. But certainly something that, um, yeah, should be looked into for sure. Yeah, a follow-up question on, on ports as well, Russell, and how much was from anonymous. Um, how how much uptake do you see on green ports to date? Is it becoming more mainstream now? I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I think yes. Um, as as the some of the information that we gathered through our pilot study suggests, uh, it's very wide range of whether ports are approaching green standards or um, or, or whether they're electing not to, or whether they just are unsure how to. Um, I think with that second follow-up question we had uh, where the ports, where do they think the future um, pressures are going to be coming from, um, that very much shows the understanding, the level of understanding that, that the pressures are growing. So I think therefore it will become more mainstream. I think the challenge for ports that we come back to is where do they align themselves to, um, how do they get to that greening level um, some of these ports are very small and um, very remote so it comes back to trying to have an industry body or a regional approach to, to bring the ports along and identify what the what these standards may be for ports to achieve um, so very um, also a very diverse language out there around what green ports actually is is it a sustainable port or is it just a port that does some restoration projects or is it a port that achieves a complex strategy to, um, to to look at all of the facets of their impacts and, and how they can manage those. So yeah, definitely, I believe it is coming more mainstream. Glad to hear that, a lot of work to do. So I'm gonna go right to Cece for the next question. Um, well, Rasel, there are more questions for you in the Q&A box. If you wish, you can answer that online, but I'm mm -hmm. gonna... First, I hand over to CC for the next question. Is illegal wildlife trade continuing to get worse for these various tools and increased interest in policy help, uh, helping to reduce that? Thank you for the question. Um, so I would say that during the last two years, there were kind of mixed statements on that during um, the COVID-19 pandemics. So on the one hand, it got a bit better because the borders were closed um, and the borders were much better guarded, so it was more difficult for poachers to smuggle wildlife in many instances. But then on the other hand, because of the lack of tourists, there were a lot of national parks, for instance, that had to be closed. Um, a lot of rangers had to be laid off. There was not a lot of funding anymore, um, which of course makes these parks and the animals in it more vulnerable. And we had a lot of people who lost their jobs and they returned to the rural landscape. And then they engaged in, in hunting and poaching to supplement their well, almost non-existing income anymore. Um, also, what I would say is that what's a positive development in the last years is that there hadn't been a lot of focus on the transport sector. So what we talked about today, like the maritime like the shipping industry, but also airports um, and also private couriers and also on the finance side. Um, so if you look, for instance, at anti-money laundering, which is important because this is actually, if you track the money, this is how you get the people um, that are higher up in the networks and you can really disrupt the networks, which is what you want to do. You don't want to have the small scale poacher. You want to have the kingpin that's behind it. And I think in these last years, there's been a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and we have a lot of task forces now and a lot of guidelines 
um, by different institutions that make it easier kind of to do the job for law enforcers. And this is also showing that collaboration is really important, um, not just like between multilateral development banks in the private sector, um, NGOs, and of course, countries and uh, regional body representatives, um, but in general. And um, I think it's a very nice analogy actually to say, and this is what my mentor always says, is that um, the criminals, they have a really good network now. They know how to operate, they know each other, um, things move really quickly. And we need to have at least an equally sophisticated network amongst the law enforcers and the other agencies committing illegal wildlife trade to really you know, stand a chance to, to fight it and to win this fight. Thanks. Thanks, Cici. And then let me turn to Matt. Matt, thank you for sticking with us to the end. Um, if I may, I have a question for you from myself and then, then from a, an audience from here. A question about the barriers to the adopting to adopting some of nature-based solutions for coastal development in developing countries. What do you think can be done to accelerate uptake of MBS? And then the second question, uh, with uh, mega cities developing in coastal zones, uh, what are the low hanging fruit for green cities along the coast? This is also direct to any speaker in the room. If you want to add anything, please feel free. And Matt, first, you have the floor. Certainly the, the first question about barriers, I think is a very fundamental question. And to me, the starting point is to have the conversations and get, get the different sectors in the room to exchange the ideas and, and to begin to talk the same language. So at the moment, it's, it's a very rare occasion that we have a scientist in the same room as, as the financier and the government uh, person and the community. So if we can get everybody in the same room and start talking about, well, what are the opportunities? What can we do? As, as the science sector, you know, we do actually have a bunch of the solutions at least partially figured out, um, certainly ready to test. So if we can get the finance to test them at the scale in the places that the governments and the communities are ready for, then let's do that. Um, otherwise, we can keep working on developing new solutions, but if they're never tested, never implemented, of course, then we don't get to where we want to go. In, in terms of mega cities, coastal zones, low hanging fruit, that's, a, that's another really great question and to me I think the answer depends on where you are there isn't a single answer that's going to be applicable for everywhere so it's really again that conversation looking in your own system look in your own city or urban coast or rural coast and see what are the challenges do you have a lot of hard shoreline if you've got a lot of hard shoreline and you need it because there are extreme events that you have to manage while well, there's opportunities to start perhaps adding to that harsh hard shoreline to create opportunities for biodiversity but also for perhaps contaminant reduction food production you know in a way of leveraging nature the the opportunity that i'm working on the most at the moment and perhaps that i'm most interested in is in the climate mitigation opportunity of restoring the coast and regenerating the coast. You know, Russell mentioned that the maritime transport sector is, is responsible for roughly 3% of global emissions at the moment. Some of that we can perhaps um, start to reduce, but some of it is going to be quite difficult to reduce. Well, as it turns out, that restoring the coast accounts for approximately 3% of global emissions. So we could actually have a situation where by restoring the coast, we can start to mitigate some of our maritime transport emissions. And, and I would dearly love to see that happen. Thank you. Yeah, if I can just add on to that one, um, Matt, and this uh, comes back to a, a little bit about the insurance as well. With each city, obviously, Matt was suggesting quite different. They're going to be in a different setting depending on where they are. This approach, again, of getting all the different people into the room, what are the values of the city? How can we set objectives around each of the values of what these city have? I'm talking environmental values. Could be the coral reef. Um, we heard earlier as an example, could be the mangrove uh, system. Um, 
And then basically you set key objectives and then you set levels of acceptable change around those and you, you have agreement on those sorts of things that so people all um, in the room establishing what these values are. It's just setting, yeah, setting standards and things like that around to make sure that you can achieve or maintain these, these systems or these values as um, these mega cities move forward. It's a huge challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Russell. We can take maybe one more question. Uh, one, one more question from the floor. There will be, what are the, for Russell, please, what are the considered the main environmental impacts of ports during construction? then during operations and how we can design ports to mitigate those impacts and it'd be more regenerative as suggested earlier than that. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. Thanks for that one. Um, again, they're quite different depending on where the port's gonna be, what the port's going to do, how the construction is, but typically main impacts from ports in terms of their construction is firstly, it's habitat loss. You've got to clear somewhere to, to place the port. Um, you've got indirect impacts, the port's going to change, coastal process is going to change, the water flow, the tides might change, which then impacts on different biodiversity or groups, communities living in those areas. Um, usually there's dredging involved, so you've got to go and dig out a whole area of um, marine sediments and move that somewhere. There's impacts associated with that. Um, noise, you're going to have underwater noise, marine mammals, um, interaction with marine fauna, um, it, it list really goes on. Um, it can be quite big. Um, in terms of management of those, it's identifying what they all are. So before you set off to develop your port, identify what all the receptors are, look at all the different coastal processes, have, so understanding the ecosystem or the ecology of the area that you're setting out to, um, to, to put this development in. Um, once you identify that area, you have a better understanding of the changes that the development's going to make and then you can put in mitigation around those changes. Mitigation, it's engineering or it's um, barriers. It, it, the list is, is quite vast, but it's very much um, applicable specifically to, to, to these investigations you undertake. Um, again, during operations, ports are, and, and shipping are responsible for you know, a large amount of um, air emissions, um, pollution through the handling of the you know, potentially um, contaminants, substances and things like that, which can be washed or spilled. So in terms of during operations, managing those, again, very vast. So it's, it's setting up infrastructure that's specific um, to handle the particular um, products that you're going to make, or handle the product, sorry. Um, it's identifying what the potential risks of the products and the operations are, setting everything up to minimise that wherever possible. Um, certainly looking to um, future technologies uh, where we can use you know, um, green energy in a new port development might be able to apply that to reduce a lot of emissions. Uh, you can look at efficiencies of how the handling system works so you don't have long, uh, you know, um, large uh, traffic bank up of trucks sitting there just idling away. They could turn their engines off, have a ticket system, which is software to software driven when their ticket comes up they come and collect their loads uh, again very vast number of um, you know management strategies that can be applied there's, there's a lot out there um, and particularly in um, developing a, a new port or a new construction it's the perfect time to be actually looking at all this um, and achieving the best result you can um, some of the older facilities much more difficult to do and more expensive so yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Thanks for some very practical suggestions, insightful is indeed. So let's wrap up with one last question to CC and time is running short. So allow me to direct the last question to you. How much are the demand side approaches, reducing demand for IWT products being integrated into IWT efforts you are involved in? Please, CC. Thank you for that. Um, well, in general, unfortunately, demand reduction is considered not to be sufficiently addressed, um, but there are um, certain NGOs that focus specifically on demand reduction activities. So also, I think in the last years, um, there has been like a greater focus on that. And without demand reduction, of course, it's very difficult to kind of curb um, the, the entire supply chain. 
So if you look at the project that ADB was involved in the combating environmental crime in the Philippines, we had an entire component. We had three different components of the project and we had an entire component um, designated for demand reduction where we did uh, consumer surveys and we created a lot of knowledge products, social media cards, we had radio guestings and so on to really make sure that the message is brought out to the wider audience um, to understand this issue and to um, yeah, be aware of the challenges and how that affects every one of us. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, it's all the question and answers. Well, with that, it's time for us to move to the closing point. Um, very quickly, I'd like to cover this morning with some takeaway points uh, we have discussed today, uh, various aspects of green coastal development. Matt um, have bring us through the blue road, um, the resilience, restoration, and the regeneration of the coastal development he has pointed out the top 10 risks um, that we need to face and the transform that we can transformative ways that we can take to achieve a sustainable, regenerative and reproductive future. And Josh, he had led us to uh, an introduction of insurance tools to support nature-based solutions. Um, he has pointed out that nature has provided myriad services to a variety of stakeholders, creating incentives to maintain them and to restore them in the event of damage, especially in the disaster risk reduction. And insurance can be a good tool that can finance maintenance and restoration as part of broader risk management and risk financing strategy. And SEC feature has bring us an introduction on tools and techniques to detect illegal wildlife trade in seaports and airports. She has pointed, she has led us to focus on improving the infrastructure and checkpoints, including seaports, airports, and land border checkpoints of both entry and um, and then last, Russell Stevens, I take us over the green port standards with the regional approach. They have analyzed a wide range of challenges faced by Southeast Asian ports with respect to greening, and has also pointed out that very large gap between top performing ports versus smaller regional ports with respect to environmental management and performance. And last, they remind us that a regional approach of port greening is recommended to bring in the gap between ports and the review many of the current challenges faced. So thank you so much, all of the speakers. We are very happy to have you today. And um, before closing, allow me to do a little advertisement for our next session of the series, uh, Round Table of Champions, which is going to take place on the 21st of July. It will build on the, third, on the three webinars that we had in the three months, on the wonderful discussions that we had thus far, and form them up into messages to COP15 uh, part two to the delegates and to uh, the post 2020 global biodiversity framework discussion. So in closing, I'd like to well, express my sincere appreciation to all of our speakers and our friends and colleagues who are being with us today. And also big thanks as goes to our team, Kamar, Fran, Duncan, Tingai, Kim, Trixie, and Tinky for orchestrating this webinar series together. Okay, well, um, I wish you a good afternoon and good evening. And some of us, some of you, good morning. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye.